Good evening. My name is Alastair Summerlee. I'm the President and Vice Chancellor of the University of Guelph, and it's my absolute privilege and pleasure to welcome you here this evening. Um, I especially uh, welcome all of our visitors who've come from outside the immediate Guelph uh, community and family. Uh, it's very nice to see some of you um, coming down the 401 to uh, find this little place in the boonies that really is the heart and soul of um, anything to do with the creative arts. Um, and I hope that you will go away burning with the same kind of passion that we have about what goes on here. Um, this is a, another stellar event in the now long history of the Schenkman Lectures. And uh, it would be remiss if I did not recognize Dasha Schenkman, who um, now seems some time ago uh, graciously came to the University of Guelph to see what we were doing and agreed that she would sponsor these lectures. So Dasha, would you mind just standing so that we can acknowledge you, please? As I think uh, everybody here realizes, this is very much about um, the lecture that we're going to hear, but it's also a very exciting time for our students to be able to showcase their work, um, talk with people who are equally passionate about art, and, uh, and gain, I hope, some experience of what it's like to show work. So if you haven't um, seen the uh, exhibits, please make sure that you go back and see them. Um, there are always uh, willing individuals to talk about what they've been doing and what they are hoping to portray. I want to acknowledge um, two longtime friends of the School of Fine Art and Music, uh, Tony uh, uh, Sherman and Margaret Priest. Um, Margaret was on faculty here, in fact, I have to say that Margaret is the very reason that I became civilized and learned about um, art, um, because we were on a committee together that actually helped push forward uh, the MFA in uh, here. Um, and uh, together, Tony and Margaret have been great supporters of the school and continue to be great friends of the University of Guelph. So thank you to both of you. I'd like to uh, actually ask the director of the School of Fine Art and Music, John Kissick, to come forward and say a few words um, to introduce our moderator this evening and then uh, to introduce our illustrious speaker um, who told me yesterday that he, uh, this is the first time that he's spoken after retirement um, and uh, uh, we're very privileged to have you here, Dave. Thank you for taking the time to be here. So John Kissick, please. Thank you, President Summerlee, and on behalf of the faculty, staff, and students of the School of Fine Art and Music, a very good evening to everyone on this very special day in our calendar. Today's events, both our Shankman Lecture and the Open Studios, celebrate the University of Guelph as one of Canada's preeminent programs in the visual arts. And we're very glad to have you here with us to celebrate and enjoy. I sincerely hope you've had an opportunity to actually visit the studios of our students. Uh, but if you haven't, uh, there are buses which will be leaving directly from outside here, directly after the lecture, and the studios will be open until 9 o'clock this evening. So if you haven't had a chance, I hope you'll take the opportunity to chat with our students and see the very, very good work that's going on here. As a school, we are rightfully proud of our rigorous programs, our excellent faculty, our passionate students, and our extremely loyal alumni. And we're also extremely aware that our good fortune is due in large measure to those in the community who continue to share our dream, a dream of creating a truly international caliber program in the visual arts, capable of preparing this country's best and brightest young artists for meaningful careers at the regional, 
the national and indeed the international level. It is a lofty goal, I know, but as the quality of our students and the reputation and generosity of our alumni attest, it is very much within reach. I would like to take a minute just to thank a few people without whom this wonderful event would never be. To this year's organizational committee of Vicki Isatam, Sandra Rechico, and Jen Lorette of the College of Arts, Aidan Ware of the McDonald Stewart Arts Centre, Professors James Carl, Susan Dobson, and Robert Enright, all who have been instrumental in various ways to make this day possible, I offer my deepest thanks and appreciation. I would also like to take this opportunity to publicly thank President Alistair Summerlee for his unwavering support of the fine arts on this campus. His commitment to the cultural life of this campus, this community, and indeed the region continues to mean a great deal to all of us who fight in the trenches every day. I would also like to acknowledge the support of Dean Donald Bruce of the College of Arts, who has been instrumental in, and very enthusiastic in supporting our recent school initiatives. I would also like to acknowledge, because this is the first year that he is here in his official duties as Chancellor, uh, David Mervish. Sure. <laughs> And just to piggyback on what Alistair said, I do would like to once I would like to once again acknowledge um, Margaret Priest and Tony Sherman. Um, your generosity and your extraordinary loyalty is is not only heartwarming but it's inspirational. Uh, so often in the arts community, we tend to take care of the young. We tend to um, be successful, and then we live out our days. But there are special artists who continue to make art and to continue to nurture the young people who are coming up. Um, and so to Margaret and to Tony, my sincere thanks. And finally, this is our seventh Shankman Lecture, and it's the seventh year in a row that I will look into Dash's eyes and tell you how much this means to this community. And I think you can see the crowd this evening. Uh, your generous gift made all this possible. And we hope you're proud of what's going on. So with no further ado, please welcome research professor Robert Enright, who will introduce this, our seventh Shankman Lecturer in Contemporary Art. I feel so good to speaking after a wounded bird. <laughs> One of the things that never gets said, by the way, is the role that John Kissick plays in the success of this department. Um, he's unbelievable. In a 2006 essay on the eternally interesting Francis Picabia, Dave Hickey wrote, on first encounter, the proliferating sprawl of Picabia's life and work seems chaotic and suspiciously frivolous. So it might seem could you characterize Dave Hickey's life and work. But gradually, you begin to realize what a comprehensive chaos of ideas and language he's left in his wake, and you begin to understand that over the length of his career, no rules have been left unbroken, no boundaries unbreached, and no style unchallenged. I hope Dave will forgive my shameless pilfering of his style. No, let me be truthful. I hope he'll forgive my outright theft of his words in attempting to describe a life lived in art, and I do mean lived, a life that is a challenge to any of us involved in the arts wherever we might find ourselves. Dave Hickey has changed things, most famously in his resuscitation of D Beauty's Dead Body and the Invisible Dragon, published in 1993, and now again, it seems, in his recent announcement of self-imposed exile from an art world that in his estimation has become venal and stupid. Up until now, he has been productive, though. <laughs> He's written books, most notably The Indivisible Dragon, four essays on beauty and air guitar, essays on art and democracy, and a rough estimate of some 300 articles on damn near anything you can think of, from Fra Angelico to Foucault, 
from Perry Mason to psychedelic culture, from exile on Main Street to the Lakers and zone defense, and from Robert Maplethorpe to Chet Baker, his secret sharer and unwitting accomplice to the best and most disgusting of my adventures. He has been, in his own words, beguiled by the bird with his horn and Velasquez with his tiny brush. And here I'm using a felicitous phrase from his friend, the artist Ken Price, in remarking that Hickey has walked the line between bewitching and ludicrous. While walking that walk, he's come up with some fancy talk as well. Hickey's an absolute delight to read, verving and undulating through ideas and language, an apostate lapidarian who writes love songs for people who live in a democracy. He calls Ken Price the Glenn Gould of object makers, and he's described university professors as spiteful monks sworn to silence, like silly proprietary eunuchs in some sultan's harem. I wish, by the way. His stealth description in an article soon to appear in Vanity Fair magazine in which he addresses his reasons for leaving the art world is that he's a writer, a rock and roller, a doper, and a drifter. And you sense that he might have added to this sing-song list a poet, a pauper, a pawn, and a king, but he closes with his being more a penniless rake than a rowdy. It's a rowdiness devoutly to be wished. He won the Frank Jewett Mather Award for Distinction in Art Criticism in 1994, and in 2001, he was awarded a MacArthur Fellowship, the Genius Grant. This is the seventh annual Shankman Lecture, and I think I'm correct in saying from the audience it's the most anticipated in an already distinguished series. I'm told that Dave assured a colleague in our administration that he would behave. I hope he wasn't telling the truth. I want to end returning to where I began with apologies to T.S. Eliot. The purloined essay on Francis Bacabi I mentioned at the beginning of this introduction was called His Purity. Let me steal Dave's words one more time. Please join me in welcoming the pure Dave Hickey. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the president of the university for wearing better shoes than I have. And, uh, Also, I, there is a lesson in my being here which artists can take. Uh, I live in Santa Fe, New Mexico now, and this is about as far as you have to travel to get a lot of attention you don't deserve. So, <laughs> uh, but thank you very much for coming. What I'm going to try to talk about tonight uh, really goes into two parts. Uh, I'd like to talk about uh, civilization. <laughs> Uh, because I think the ex in America and uh, Canada, particularly the extent of these great countries and the balkanization of their universities have pretty much destroyed civilization as we know it. Uh, survey the writer, the artists you know and see the last time one wrote a book or listened to a Beethoven quartet. Uh, I think we have uh, pretty much destroyed uh, uh, Western civilization, I, I don't know about Eastern civilization, but we're getting started on that. Uh, but uh, we'll fix it. Uh, I think we have, we have done it through as uh, care, uh, under the guise of care, as, uh, Jean, as Michel Foucault would say, care is control. And uh, care is always control. And. Uh, I'm here to argue for a little less of it, a little more benign neglect. Um, my lecture really falls into two parts. First, I want to tell you about my dream department that I made up, uh, that if I could ideally teach the arts, uh, this is how I would like to do it. And then second of all, I would like to talk about my experience teaching. And I avoided teaching for many, many years until my health insurance hit six figures. And uh, I decided that I'd better find somebody else to pay for it. So I taught for 20 years in uh, Las Vegas where I didn't even break even. I never got sick a day. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, my, my ideal, uh, civilization department, the craft of civilization, would leave the arts intact. And the reason it would leave the art department intact 
is the same reason that the art departments don't turn out any artists, because 70% of the people who go into art departments do not go into art departments to be artists. They go in to be the curator at the Boise State Museum. They go in for the degree. And so if you're trying to teach artists with a lot of people who want to go to Boise, you're in trouble. And I got into a lot of it. Uh, I had a great deal of success teaching artists, but I had a great deal of problems trying to get sort of art-related activities integrated into the curriculum simply because I was supposed to raise their consciousness and to uh, help them with critical thinking. And, uh, and I was supposed to become engaged in their problems. And uh, I will say for the kids of Las Vegas, I was there for 20 years and nobody asked me for anything but who was a good mechanic. I, I, unlike Los Angeles, where I've taught before, I didn't get to hear about anybody's abortion, uh, anybody's bipolar disorder, none, none of this, which is very wise, I think, because I am not licensed in psychotherapy, as all of my colleagues seem to have been. Uh, so I would, uh, first, as to speaking to the students, I would like to say, Never tell anything to a professor because then they have you forever. You see, the moment you raise your voice in dissent, they'll say, remember what Counselor Rick did to you in the shower at summer camp, you know. And so uh, ne never share intimacies uh, with professors at all. You'll pay and you'll pay and you'll pay. Uh, now. As to my little, my little civilization department in the uh, university, the, the, the smartest solution that I thought of was that it would be in the athletic department. Uh, I want it to be in the athletic department because I want to exercise some judgment over the skills of incoming students. In other words, if you can't dribble, you can't play basketball, okay? I mean, that's the general idea. The second thing is, is that the bureaucratic pyramid in athletics is really simple. There is the president, and there is the AD, the athletic director, and there is the coach. And the coach recruits the students and hires the assistant coaches, and it's really simple. There's not a provost in sight. Uh, and so you're, you're dealing with an ext uh, 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 what would be called the, the basic management rule in, uh, in Las Vegas, which is flatten the pyramid, flatten the pyramid, get the top closer to the bottom, use your union reps as representatives, as, as, as junior executives. Uh, and so, so you have this school that's in the athletic department, and like most athletic departments, we're not over-concerned with your getting a degree because having a degree will help you get a job teaching. Don't ever think about that. I taught for 20 years and I had lovely experiences, but it is a job that makes it almost impossible for you to function as an artist. Why? Because you don't do much work, but it takes all day, every day to not do much work. Because first, you've got your parking place. Are you going to go back home and work and then come back and not have a parking place? No, you're going to go have coffee and talk to your friends about their kids at soccer practice. Uh, are, are you going to just cancel that meeting at 4 because your class is out at 11 AM? Of course not. You're going to be there for that meeting at 4. And so the job for which you work maybe, uh, say, outside nine hours a week uh, ends up taking about 60. And so uh, if you're an artist, the time you have in the studio is gold. And uh, had, when I began teach, uh, teaching, and I didn't really start until, as I say, till I was 50 and my health insurance hit uh, 100 grand, uh, I... Uh, I didn't do it for, for just that reason, because it sucks all of your time. 
I mean, just finding a parking place. You know, you could stay at home and flip pennies and do better. I, uh, I have a, also there is this aspect of being an art teacher, which is you think you should be showing at Larry Gagosian, or you think you should be showing at Pace. You feel wrong somehow, and you feel generally wronged by the art market itself, which has neglected your talent. Although it has bought you a beautiful house in the suburbs, a studio, a swimming pool, and three cars. But that's what you pay for not having a career. That's what it costs. You've got a uh, pickup truck, you have a nice car for dining, and then you have your sort of midlife crisis car, you know, like upscale Camaro kind of car. And, uh, and you have every Elvis record ever recorded on CD. And you also uh, forgot to read the newspaper because you're slowly devolving uh, as you teach in the university. Uh, and every day you go into class and you get what you went to art for, which is that little bounce of undeserved attention. You know what I mean? People who look up to you, who call you Mr. Hickey, can you believe that? And uh, who are just so, so happy for their A's and their so happy for your words of wisdom and you've helped them so much with their work and you leave and you feel great and you think well hell i did a good job teaching today i think i'll watch the raptors i don't need to paint that painting because you have sucked up the need for painting that painting was to get a little freaking attention in the first place and so the university gives you just enough attention so you don't work now I'm being quite serious here, and had I not been a disciplined writer when I started teaching at the age of 50, uh, I get up at 3.30 and I write every day. I like to write until the phone rings and reminds me I'm a professor. And so then I change completely into a professor and I say, hey, do you have that 49 slash uh, Y or whatever the form is that I've forgotten to turn in? and. Uh, Oh, I'm sorry, I only turned in two. I should have turned in three. And uh, and then my my day is over at this point. I'm, I'm through writing and I do my job at the university. Uh, young people who are not trained tend to get up and go to think, well, I'll just do my work first and then I'll come home. But that never happens. And so then you take a job in Boise, Idaho, just to help you over. First three years, you go to New York every year and you wander around. And then either you or your wife are pregnant. And then you have a hostage to fortune. And then the university has you by the balls, as we say in Las Vegas. And then you can never leave. And then you buy a house. And then you have a mortgage and a baby. And then you have another baby. And then you will never leave, and then you don't go to New York for three years, and then you've never heard of New York, and you don't know where everything is, and now you're scared of New York, you see? Because the lifestyle is so different there. And, you, and then, then whenever your friends come, you say the, the words that translate into, I'm about to blow my brains out, which are, oh, we have a nice life here. Now, if, if anybody ever tells you that we have a nice life here, help them. <laughs> you do, do, you, do you understand? Because that means that they're desperate and unhappy and they have to somehow get out of town. And then finally the children leave or they go into custody or they go into therapy or <laughs> wherever children go. And, uh, and they hate you, of course, because you've left them out in freaking Boise. And, uh, you know, when they could be in New York or in LA. And so you're all alone out there with a wife you've learned to hate or a husband you've learned to hate.
because he or she is stuck in Boise too. And you have, you have this sort of difficult situation about what are you going to do with the rest of your life? So then you integrate your art into the local lifestyle. It's like if you're in Missoula, Montana, let's say, God help, you say, well, what, I say, well, what are you doing now? I said, oh, I'm doing work with fishing flies. I do little teeny fishing flies. Or if you're in Portland, you say, well, most of my work today derives from the totem pole and the tradition of the Native Americans in this area. Or you think of some lifestyle solution. If you live in Santa Fe, you paint Indians with a whole lot of wrinkles and one feather, you know, that kind of thing. And so you do that to accommodate yourself to the culture that you're in, and you're DED. Do you understand? And so the first, the first thing is, is that uh, I really like kids. I was the person who had the idea that we should have a baby channel. Now they have it. Six months ago, I was called everybody in Hollywood and say, have a baby channel all day long. The one idea of mine they didn't pick up on is that I wanted to do a mini-series on the life of Dr. Spock, the great uh, pediatrician. I wanted Leonard Nimoy to play Dr. Spock, <laughs> but they haven't picked up on that yet. But So I'm fairly prescient in these areas. Uh, now, if you hate the art market, which is the only place where your students who want to be artists will succeed, how are you going to treat that marketplace? It's a real marketplace. And I've found over the years that there is a genuine distinction between the kind of artists who are successful in the art world generally and who are successful in universities. Pause for effect. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and this has nothing to do with the quality of the art you make. Uh, this is, I will say there's, there's, no, there's been no deficit of the quality of good art that's made the world around it has changed. But artists who live in the real art world, the art, secular art world, let's say, like to deal with equals. They like to deal with peers. They like to deal with their equals face to face, eye to eye, straight up. People who are comfortable in hierarchies, who like to bend down or look up, they're happy in schools because schools are rigorously hierarchical. And you've got the dean up there and the kids down here, and you want the kids to love you and you want the dean not to notice you. And so uh, you're put into a very complex situation, but if you take to that, and if you take to that kind of authority and that kind of obeisance, then that's where you should better be. Also, you shouldn't shouldn't be in uh, teaching in a university if you can carry on a literate conversation. This is more useful out in the world. Do, do, you, do you understand what I'm saying? Is that it's like, uh, you ever have a literate conversation at a faculty dinner? The first faculty dinner I went to, my art historical colleague wanted to think, no, we're talking about now, we're putting in a 302 drawing class. Don't you think it should be numbered 303 in case we put in a prerequisite and it should be 302? And that was what I withdrew from my fellow colleagues conversation. And happy to them, because there are people who love this and I'm not really being judgmental. I'm just saying know yourself, know yourself, you know. And if you're comfortable in a hierarchy, you know, and, if, and, you, and you're too old to go to seminary, uh, then you should, uh, you should probably go to a university. Uh, but if you think like you should, feel like you should have a career, and you feel like your work should be recognized, there is no stop date as long as you are working. In other words, uh, my friend John Baldessari became well known when he was 58. Do you understand? He worked all those years. He burned all of his work. He started over. He worked in it 58. He had a show at Leo Castelli. And the reason he did is that one of his ex students, David Sally, guy who was already showing at Leo Castelli, got him that show. So there's no stop date. You can make it early, you can make it late. 
But until you quit, you're still an artist. Do you understand? And until you stop producing, you're still an artist. So my idea, if I were king, or if I, I, was, I was art coach in your art athletic department, first I would obey the rules that I obeyed when I inadvertently ran the graduate program at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Uh, I say inadvertently because I took the job there because they said, hey, we want to start a graduate program. And I thought, all right, these are my kind of people. It turned out what they wanted was TAs. They wanted people to carry litho stones. They wanted people to clean up the painting studio. They wanted hip. You know what that's what we say in the South. We need some hip. And um, they had not the faintest interest in graduate students. And so I sort of ended up with more control than I should have had over letting people in. And I had more control since I taught the only graduate courses uh, since not, not because I demanded it, but because nobody wanted to teach a graduate course, because that's when they had coffee. And uh, so I remember one day I went over to the coffee shop across from the school, and about four guys over there, my colleagues were having coffee, and I thought, that's great that they're all over there bonding when they're off work. They weren't off work. Their TAs were teaching their classes, you know, and so. Uh, then I understood that about universities. Uh, but I think it's important if I, you're, I'm recruiting for my little, my little civilization course that I, I, as a part of the athletic department, I have the right to demand skills. Do you understand? You have to be able to dribble. You have to have a jump shot. You have to do ever push the blocking sled. You have to be able to fucking do something to get in. And therefore, you can exert some sort of qualifications over, you know, what you do to get in. And then, why would it just be an art department? Because art, art is like the thinnest little layer of butter across the English muffin of the North American continent. Uh, it is like nothing in any particular place. But there's a music department who the art department never speaks to. There is a drama department whom the art department never speaks to. There is a music department. So I would plan to let in the best students that I could recruit from any of the arts simultaneously. This means for a guy this would be great, because this means there would be tall girls and leg warmers around all the time. And, uh, but then we would teach one another our disciplines. We would have artists who knew how to read music. We would have musicians who had heard of Ed Reinhardt. Uh, and the reason that I think this is so important, because I would say 80% of the artists I knew started off doing something else. They started off as fiction writers, as dancers, as this, as that. So this is a chance to be around all of the people who are engaged in cultural activities at your school. Now, because in a school I know like the University of New Mexico or, or Nevada, Nevada has had exceptions because it had casinos, but and also because the girls that worked in the gentlemen's establishments modeled for uh, our drawing classes. So we had probably the only graduate class in the world that hung out in a titty bar, but, um, but we were respectful. <laughs> and, uh, and occasionally if I had a graduate student who uh, needed 500 bucks, she'd look up and there she was, you know? And so um, anyway, my, my, my point is, if you put all these people in there, if everybody can read music, if everybody knows, knows what an opera is, if everybody knows what a sonata is, if everybody knows what an odalisque is, you're gonna find some friends, you know? I remember I was talking to Richard Serral one day. I said, who's your inspiration, Richard? And Richard said, Balanchine, the great choreographer. And I said, Balanchine? He says, this is Balanchine, it's the only one, all other choreographers are science fiction people because they're interested in creating the illusion of lightness. 
And Balanchine's dancers all have weight. They always come down. They always hit the ground. They always stand firm. He said, and I was thinking about this thing of the weight on the ground as being a relatively important part of making art. And so all of Richard's steel pieces and all of this amount to a kind of choreography. You know, and that is, in other words, he's choreographing things that depend upon one another as they do in the dance. So I, that is, and I, I, I can t tell you, uh, any number of other artists who have who give, have given me examples like this, uh, who were concert pianists, or who were this, who were that. So, so let's just put them all in there together and teach them how to do everything, and uh, let's teach them how to read music. Mostly, I think that would be the best thing for them to know. French would help, uh, since that's a language of music. Uh, I think that almost, but but to. This would, what this would do would be to overcome the isolation of 15 or 16 graduate students in the middle of freaking nowhere. You see, there would be, you, you would have 20, 30 maybe. You'd have dancers, you would have singers, you would have flute players. I don't know, yeah, sure, you would have flute players. I'm indulging my own preferences there. Um, but, uh, but you would have people from the cultures, they could teach one another their art while they learned art in general. And in this area, if they wanted to take an art history course, there would still be an art history department there. If they wanted to take an elementary drawing class, there would still be one over in the art department. Whatever they wanted to take, they could take. Now you say, well, what about the degree? Uh, Anybody here play uh, athletics, play, play basketball? Okay, I knew it was, but that would be a big crowd, and so no, no, I could just step back. Uh, I used to tutor a, uh, a basketball player at UNLV named Sean Marion, who's very good, who plays, I think, for the Mavericks now. And, uh, and Sean was a very bright guy. And, uh, and I asked him once what he'd learned in college, and he said, well, I learned to lie and cheat and steal. And uh, he says, I come from a very straight Christian family, and I learned everything about buying, cheating, and stealing that I know from the basketball program. We would try to discourage that. Do you understand? And but I say, well, Sean, are you here to get a degree? He says, no. I said, why are you here? I am here to make the pros. And he did. This would be the eye, the trick. When you graduated from my program, maybe you'd get a certificate, you know what I mean, or, or like a, a little thing to wear around your neck, you know, or one of those little chains like poker they give up at poker tournaments. But you wouldn't have to get a degree because you don't want a freaking degree. You know, that's like a black mark. You want to make the pros. That the whole point of my little program was be that we turn out civilized people who know what music is, who know what opera is, who know what art is, who can make the prose, and who have contacts in the world of culture generally, rather than just, well, I know this girl that works over at uh, Angela Westwater's, and yeah, great. Uh, in other words, you would, you would have contact with the broader base of culture in the West and culture in the East. I'm not, uh, I don't know uh, if I want you to learn how to read Eastern, Eastern music or Farsi, but maybe so, why not? Um, but my point is, is that we reduce the isolation. We have people who can learn from one another. You asked major influence on Jackson Pollock, Louis Armstrong, do you understand? Of course, no Dixieland, no Jackson Pollock because that's where it comes from. And so what if Jackson Pollock had thought, oh, I can't play the cornet very well? He didn't think that. He wanted to make the pros. And if you're all, everybody in your, in your department wanted to make the pros, then you would have a good degree of, of cross-semination, and you would also have a good level of competition. And uh, the best thing you can have, uh, 
the art world is built on linear structures of peers. Your peers are who you live with till you die. It doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't matter what your little brother thinks. It matters what your peers think. If you write a sonata and your friends that are writers think it's a good sonata, it's probably a good sonata and you don't care what anybody else thinks. Do you do understand? If When I was a kid, I mean, I didn't care what anybody thought, but Peter Plagueis and Peter Sheldahl and my other art critic friends, you know, uh, I'm totally unconcerned, you know, about what uh, Clement Greenberg thought or somebody, somebody like that. He was a real asshole to it. But um, I didn't mean that, I didn't mean that as, as a platonic statement, a genuine asshole. Uh, but the, my, my point is, is that why don't we put all of these people together and see what happens? You see, and why don't we let them teach one another their own crafts? And why don't we teach fat figurative painters how to dance? You know, just the increased ability to dance would help Canada more than almost anything I can think of. Uh, this seems to be a sort of a dance deficient culture up here. Um, I could be wrong, but maybe it's because of all the black people. Uh, but um, that happens from time to time. But my point is, is that I wanted to get rid of the faults of the art department, which is that you're dealing with, uh, say, of roughly 37,000 BFAs per semester. 37,000 BFAs and an attrition rate of 98.2. That's who makes another work of art after they get their BFAs. That isn't a good exit number, kids. Uh, and then they say, oh, well, she's the curator at Boise State. Well, that's not making the pros. I'm sorry. And uh, you know what I mean. And it's like, this would create a situation which is the hardest situation in the world in America and in Canada too, and is how do you be brave? Do you understand? How do you be brave? How many situations come up in which courage is the qualifier? Well, you get in a program where the idea is to make the pros and you find out pretty damn quick. And if somebody asks you who David Mervish is, David Mervish, David Mervish, I know who David Mervish is. Everybody in the world knows who David Mervish is. You don't. You know what I mean? Well, you probably do. But, uh, <laughs> but what I'm saying is, Europe, you, you want to become a part of it. Uh, and, 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 and you want to participate in it. Uh, Ellen Phelan, who was uh, the girl I was talking with, went to um, school in Detroit. At, is it Wayne? What is that? Wayne State. Uh, is a very wonderful uh, painter, and she's married to Joel Shapiro, who is a fairly good sculptor. And uh, and together they're wonderful. Separately they're insufferable. But she went in to try to endow a professorship, and they thought she was just another fat Jewish girl. And Wayne State lost a uh, lost a position because they weren't paying attention. They didn't have on a Zania suit, do you understand? And sans Zania, no, you know, uh, patronage. And so the, the situation is, let's, let's put the pressure on. Let's do something that's freaking hard. Let's make, let's make a, 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 a system that says, uh, yeah, we'll give you a certificate when you read or we'll give you one of those Bracelets, the bracelets are my best idea. Uh, but otherwise, you make the pros. And if you don't make the pros, what is the consequence of that? Shame. Do you know what the worst thing in the world is? Shame. Guilt is a hangnail compared to shame. Do you understand what I'm saying? Is that let's just let's just up the ante a little bit and see what happens. And then we would have all these people that do other things. We would have musicians who decided they wanted to be painters. 
we would have choreographers who decided they wanted to be sculptors, and this happens a lot. A lot of people come from the dance to sculptor and go back and forth. Uh, we would have all of these people together. They would, they would form a real community, a civilized community, which is where they know what adagio means, uh, you know, and where they know what the words mean, where they know what an aria is, where they know what, uh, you know, what Wozzeck is, uh, when they know what culture is. And again, there's all this shit out there you can steal. You know what I mean? Uh, I mean, you know, I, I could have a whole career on just stuff I've stolen from modern operas. It'd be better than most modern operas, but it's all still there to be stolen. And then you would have a peer group that would be larger than the peer group in the scattered, isolated parts of the United States and Canada. Uh, it would be a blow back at that idiot Thomas Jefferson uh, who invented what I called the suburban university. Uh, Thomas Jefferson's idea is that if we put universities out in the fields with cows, that this would make for better universities. And that's what we have. Y'all been at the University of Illinois? Okay, the University of Illinois is built of Georgian buildings on steroids, like 10-story Georgian buildings with cows grazing out there. And it's like, you're gonna go into a studio in a 10-story fake Georgian building with a cow outside and make art? It's just too stupid. And your daddy only sent you there because Champagne's one of the, the safest places for young women to go to school next to Santa Barbara, which costs so much more money. I've heard that about a thousand times. Uh, they can walk home after a party. Come on. You know, I, uh, and you can, you can learn if you're in a helpful environment. And what is a helpful environment is you're in a group of people who are intellectually equivalent, not all intellectually equivalent. Lead guitar players don't really have intellects. You know, they're, a lot of, they're like, well, they're good painters don't have intellects either. It goes from the eye to the hand or it goes from the ear to the hand. The brain is totally passed up in this situation. But they're always useful. <laughs> You can go up to them and say, what is the da 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 You say, oh, that's Richie Blackmore and written Deep Purple. You know, and they can tell you stuff like that. Uh, you don't even have to use Shazam, you know? And so I um, heard a, found a beautiful song on Shazam the other day. It's a Billy Vera song called uh, At This Moment. And uh, we were at the first cafeteria, not a lot of resources for culture and uh, in uh, New Mexico, and uh, so I just turned on my Shazam and they were playing Billy's song. And Billy's a musicologist at UCLA, but he used to have a band called Billy and the Beaters, and uh, his beautiful song called At This Moment, you should go download it right now. Uh, but uh, my, my, my point is, let it spread out. Create boundaries, create standards. One of the ways you, you create standards is you can kick people off the team. Do you understand what I'm saying? You can say, clean out your locker, turn in your playbook, and go over to the art department. You see, and that could be arranged very easily. And it wouldn't be like we're stealing their education. We're just like rewarding them for being doofuses. And, uh, same thing would happen with your assistant coaches or faculty. You know, if somebody's not really performing, you just replace them next year with, a, you know, somebody from the Giants and, uh, or from some other uh, institution. But my, my point is, is that what we need in, in universities, in suburban universities spread across the North American continent, is more concentration of cultural activities by bringing dance and theater and writing and, and art and all of these things together, by teaching these people all these different things, and by taking away the benison of a degree. 
this is this, you know, this, this be a hard sell for your mom. You know what I mean? Now, if you have a degree to fall back on. Uh, you ever try falling back on a degree? <laughs> you read that better luck hooking on Santa Monica Boulevard. Uh, but I think that, that, that my idea for the way that you do this is you get people to teach each other in their own discipline. And then you teach them the history of opera. You, teach, you can even teach them the history of Chinese opera, which is really complicated because there are 360 forms of it. Um, and you could teach them, they could learn all of this stuff. They could learn who Billy Budd was. They could learn you know, who Tristram Shandy was. They could learn what Wozzeck is. You know what I mean? They could learn all this stuff. And you can't ever tell when you're going to need Wozzeck. You know what I mean? You just, it's going to come up one of these days. And so what I'm saying is you just bring everybody together, create a competitive situation, and basically what I would be would be the grand executioner. I would recruit you. I would come to your house and talk to your parents and tell them about the virtues of the program. And then you'd be there a year and I would kick you off the team. You know, I would be the bad guy. There would be demonstrations. There would be an underground developed. When that underground became big enough, I would quit and join it. But this is my idea of an ideal arts education. I think you should, but it's all premised on a, a couple of things. First of all, you got to have skills coming in. This is not elementary school. This is not secondary school. This is not even undergraduate school. This is graduate school. We're all grown-ups. We can all shoot a jump shot. You know what I mean? We know what the hell we're doing. We can read. If we're musicians, we can like read music. You know, uh, we, we, we all play the game, you know, and we all have some self-confidence and we all are arrogant enough to think that we can make the pros and that's very important. That means no one would ever come to me with a story about their abortion again. That's so nobody would say, I'm sorry, Miss Glass, Mr. Hickey, but my dog died. It's my favorite excuse. You don't know how many pets died during the course of a semester. Um, but uh, I miss Barney so much. Uh, excuse me for being cold, but this is the real freaking world. You want to make the pros. If you make the pros, you've gotten out of school. If you don't get out of school, you will be in school for the rest of your living days. Not only that, if you go to Missoula, Montana, and get a course, oh, uh, I run the painting track here at Missoula. Um, I'm the chairman of the painting track at Montana. Well, that sounds great, doesn't it, you know? And you go to College Art Association and all you painting track people get together and have drinks. But let's say you're like 98% of the artists I know. Let's say you decide at some point that you don't want to be a painter. You know, that you want to betray your high school sweetheart and marry that tramp that dances. You see? That's fine, but you're running the painting track in Montana. And you're stuck with that until you die with your high school romance. And that's no fun, kids. That, you end up tying fishing flies. Um, you know, or painting whimsical surrealist paintings in New Orleans using the iconography of uh, primitive Catholicism. Uh, you know, I mean, you, that is, one of the first qualities of lifestyle art is whimsy. Oh, this is just whimsical, you know. That cross is not a real cross. That's not a real ego. That's just, it's just whimsical. I was just being creative. Uh, uh, creative is the most ill-used word in the world. Creative is, first of all, it's an obstetric word. It's not like an art word. Uh, it's, an, it's a word used by people that have doctors who treat women who have babies. Uh, 
It's also a word used mostly by CEOs. Come on, gang, we're all creative people out here and we do creative management here. Can you imagine an adult art person saying anything about being creative? That's like saying, Billy, do you have toes? Uh, you know, it's like, come on. It's like, we're playing with grown-ups here. We're gonna be creative. And uh, I keep seeing these lectures by artists and they go there, they come up, it's, it's College Art Association, I've been to three of them, and, uh, and live to tell the tale. As I say, everybody at College Art Association has a small mustache and a tweed coat and that's just the girls, you know, and uh, I'm just kidding, I'm sorry, I, I couldn't resist that. I just, it just fell in my lap, I, just, I apologize. Uh, do you really want to be creative? If you're making art, that's not creative and that's not play. I see these guys standing up and say, well, I was, back in 74, I was playing around with the rectangle. So you're better to be playing with yourself than with the rectangle. Uh, Art is not play, it's fucking work. That's why they call it the work of art. You're supposed to be making art. You're not supposed to be playing. And you're not supposed to be, I was experimenting with some ideas that had to do with puppies. Uh, you're not supposed to be experimenting. You're supposed to be freaking doing it. Do you understand? I mean, you, you, that is, if you don't do it in my school, you're off the team, you know what I mean? and you didn't deserve to be on it in the first place. Uh, that is, this is, like, this is like serious crap. Universities don't have to be here. They're not for everyone. Graduate school is not for everyone. Art is not for everyone. It is an elective in the list of all of civilization's demands. You know, it's like Jacques Tati, you know, it's, he's not a requirement. You know what I mean? He's an elective. And so what in the world are we going around pretending that art is serious and that it's going to raise our consciousness and it is going to help us fulfill ourselves? How many times have I heard professors say, oh, Kimberly, I don't think this is really you. Um, that's really cruel. Uh, I know a lot of very good artists, none of whom make art that is really them. People are about 15 million times more complicated than a work of art. There are 15 artists for every artist that you see. You have to use some sort of moral decision-making process. You don't play around and you don't use your imagination. Your imagination is when you close your eyes and think of a door. You know, I mean, that's imagination. Okay. Uh, that isn't worth puke, you know? I mean, you better, you better, you're more likely to become an artist taking stat, honestly, statistics. Uh, so I think that the, 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 the problem has to do with, first, the balkanization of departments in universities and the dispersal of universities in places that have cows. So I think when you see a cow, you should not sign up. And I know this is a big problem in Canada, which is a very cow-friendly place. And so, uh, now I grew up in Texas, which is ultra cow-friendly. Uh, but I think if, if there's a cow near your classroom, you should probably not sign up. And, uh, <laughs> but, I mean, this is some serious shit. And let's say, okay, I want to be a theorist. Oh, you want to be a theorist? Do you speak German? Well, have you been to Brown? No, but I'm going to be a theorist. Why? Because theory is real hard. Theory is really easy. Theory is like playing poker with no spots on the cards. Uh, practice is hard. Do you, do you understand? Theory has three ideas. I could tell you all three of them, but then I'd waste your education. Uh, 
But I will tell you this little secret that my friend Jeremy Gilbert Roth and I and a couple of other people will argue till we did. The problem is that theory is taught by people who think theory is hard. Do you understand? Theory is not hard. It's just like a greeting card. It's just words in a row. You know, I mean, that's it. And, you know, it's, well, I'll make some exceptions like Leotar and a few people who can't really even put them in a fucking row. But uh, at the same time, I think you have to you have to understand that is if you want to play with the big boys, you've got to push the blocking sled. You know what I mean? And you've got to know what's being shown in Los Angeles and what's being shown in New York and what's being shown here and there. You, you've got to know my friend uh, Kwame Okoto in Kumsai, who uh, is known there as Almighty God, uh, who is sort of the, the God, uh, the artist God of the Ashanti. And uh, you've got to know this stuff. You know what I mean? Uh, you have to be worldly. It is not, we're not talking Annie Dillard out there. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? We're not talking about people who bring blocks of ice and cover them with oak leaves and watch them melt. We're talking about objects that will survive their creators and their patrons. This is David uh, Hume's definition of culture. It's an object or an institution that survives its creators or, and its patrons. That's what culture is. You're supposed to design orphans that go out there and survive. Do you understand? You're not supposed to design something real nice that you can stand beside and go like this. Do you understand? It's not about you. It's about civilization. Do you understand? It's about not being so stupid that you go and blow up a bunch of Buddhas because some uh, Islamic idiot told you to. You know, it's like the Taliban did. I just, I mean, that's really gets to me. Uh, I mean, that's like, that's like, you know, taking down Las Meninas or something like that. Uh, but we don't care about that. We care about getting our kids to school and we care about getting promoted to assistant chair and maybe someday we'll be a dean and then if we get by with being a dean, maybe we could be like an assistant vice president or maybe an assistant provost. Dare you dream that high. Uh, do, do you understand? I mean, you're talking about a world of such imbecility and trivialness that is beneath contempt. I deal with these people. They write contracts. They have lawyers who help them write contracts. They're idiots. Uh, you know, present company accepted. <laughs> uh, <laughs> except, except for anybody at Guelph. But what, I, what I'm saying is, and okay, let's, let's say that you're like, Let's say, it is, I've seen this happen a thousand times. A student or a professor at a university gets a great show in New York and gets good reviews. How long do they last at the university? Max 18 months. The day after they get their show, somebody says, well, we were gonna have a committee meeting, but so-and-so is off flying off to Mongolia or someplace. Or let's say you publish a great book and everybody buys it. Is everybody happy? No, they hate your freaking guts because the university is a zero sum game. Do, do you understand? If I get it, you don't. If I get the Judy B. Jones Award for excellence in teaching, that means I, everybody else didn't get it. That's a zero sum game. Only winners, everybody else is a loser. Uh, fortunately, if you live in a loft in New York and the guy that has the next loft sells a bunch of paintings to a good collector, you can sort of stand around and skim some off. You know what I mean? That's positive if the guy next door gets a good show because there are going to be all of these muckamucks standing around and you can say, come on in here. Right. I'm a pornographer, you know, or whatever. Uh, <laughs> You, 
call that pornography? You know what I mean. Uh, but one of the th and, and I will to, to give you some sort of example of the extent to which this works. As I said, when my uh, when my department started their graduate school and it was a beginning department and it had about it was a department about the size of your what do y'all like seventeen to nineteen graduate students something like that. Anyway, whatever. Uh, Enright knows, he won't tell. Uh, but, so we had about that many. Everybody had a, uh, everybody that needed a uh, scholarship had one. Uh, my friend Tim Bavington, who uh, did all of the uh, still art, the comic books and everything from The Simpsons, did not need one. Uh, but he was a, he's a very successful artist now. Uh, Everybody had a job. Here are all of these people. And because my colleagues were so inattentive, uh, I sort of instituted a regime. And I, I had like about three rules. First, uh, I know people at universities all around the United States and Europe. Second of all, I know people who teach at these universities. And third of all, I go around and lecture at these universities so I recruited people. I remember walking into the auditorium in, okay, you're gonna believe this, Logan, Utah. You know, since Utah State. And I only went up there because it wasn't far away and one of my ex-girlfriends lived there, but it's up above Ogden. It's like, and it's like a lot of Mormons, which is are girls with just a little bit too much weight on, just not a lot, and not fat, they're just, 30 girls, and uh, I'm sitting there talking to this group of people, and sitting in the back row is this Japanese kid with green hair. And I looked back there and I said, he's mine. And he had come, he had looked on the map when he came to America to see where the best snowboarding was and the best trout fishing were the two things that he liked to do. And he had come up with Logan, Utah. And I said, snowboard, trout fish, come to Vegas. Still there. Shows at Western Projects in LA. His name is Sushi Machida Gaikatsu. I think Gaikatsu means fisherman. But, um, hell, I, I don't know any of that chap talk. Uh, but my point is, you can see him. Well, it's just sort of easy to see a Japanese guy with green hair in a room full of white Mormons. I will admit that that wasn't really much of a stretch. But at the same time, I got really a, about half my students from recruiting, just like a football coach does. You go around and you recruit, and then your recruits recruit. And then my friend Vernon Fisher calls from Texas, or my friend Jeremy Gilbert Roth calls from Art Center where Tim Bivington went to school and says, this is a good one for you, Dave. And at the time that, I, that it worked, wh what we were having was a lot of cases of theory burnout. You know, is that undergraduates who had been through heavily theoretical programs, and I am a theoretician and I'm not talking down on it, but they just wanted to make shit, you know what I mean? And, uh, and they wanted to use tertiary colors and, uh, and, and, and they, they'd had no problems with whatever gender they happened to be or were intending to be. Uh, you know, they were, they were pretty loose. And, uh, and they knew how to, to uh, handicap a race. And so they came to Las Vegas. Now, it took me about three years to discover that other, other qualifications. But first of all, you have to come from a major metropolitan art city where there is real art. In other words, if you're from the backwoods of Wisconsin, you couldn't come. Now, my, my colleagues never noticed this, but I sort of required that they had grown up in the, in the, you know, in the area of uh, metro metropolitan. So my students were from Singapore and from Tokyo and from uh, East LA and from you know, New York, Miami, Chicago, Brookline, like that. And uh, that means that they weren't afraid of Las Vegas. They were there to play and work. And it is my rule as a writer and as an artist 
that there are only two things to do, play or work. The university requires enormous hours of doing neither. Do you understand? It's like somebody come up to you and say, are you working or are you playing? Oh, no, I got appointment at four. You know, um, and so you want to reduce that time, uh, you know, and you want to fill your, fill your days with fun as much as, as much as you can. And also you, you want to know people of whatever sex attracts you that have sort of low morals. And, uh, you know, and uh, or, or maybe, let's put it like that, relaxed sexual standards. And so I got all of these kids from good universities who all had skills, who all lived in major metropolitan hours, who, and what did I not have? I had no tree huggers. I had no fundamentalists. I had no farmers. I had none of the people that might confide their abortion to me. I, you, you understand, I'm not a personal person. And, uh, and I'm sorry about the baby you just slaughtered. But, uh, <laughs> which brings me to my real subject. Uh, <laughs> but, but the point is, is that if you recruit your chances of having good students go up about a thousand percent. You're supposed to go out there and work the territory, as they say in the Music Man. You know what I mean? And uh, I consider the hours I spent in the airport lounge to be gold, as the man said. And so, then when I when I had my graduate students, pretty much to the point, I had a. a kid from London, a girl from the Isle of Man, who were sort of my first really good graduate students. And I, I instituted two rules. First, no group crits. Group crits favor the glib. They do not favor good artists. If they wanted to have group crits among themselves, they were perfectly welcome to do that. But if I was there for them to show off for, and if I was there for them to degrade their colleagues, then it turned into a clusterfuck, to use a sort of a casual kind of Texas word, um, sort of a George Bush word, actually. And so, but so we had no group crits. Second rule, if you're not sick, don't call the doctor. Do you understand what I'm saying? Is that if you're okay and you think you're okay, you go right ahead. You don't need my approval. You know, I'm not gonna come in and say, oh, Kimberly, I don't think this is really you. What if it is? You know what I mean? Uh, you don't mean me to come in and say, oh, I think the blue is a little soft here. You're grownups, you're artists. If you need the doctor, I'm here. I'm a good doctor and I'm a good coach. And, uh, and that's what a coach would say. Go run some laps, you know, or play some scales or do whatever you're screwing up at. But if you're not sick and you're happy with what you're doing and you're confident about what you're doing, you don't need some old guy to come in and give you a pat on the head. You know, that's just, that's just not my job as a professor. Uh, my job is to tell you shit I don't know. Like, if you're doing the art of someone that I know fairly well, I feel like it's my responsibility to tell you that this art is being shown in Los Angeles even as we speak. Uh, now, this is not a crime. I actually once, when I was a songwriter in Nashville, uh, <laughs> I wrote a whole song to the tune of Tom Waits' Old 55. I thought it was great until somebody said, isn't that the tune of old 55? And so, oh, the shame. But uh, anyway, at least I didn't get to take it to the studio. <laughs> so, but my point is, that's my job. My job is to know the art world. My job is to say, this is the kind of work that you should show to Hudson at Feature, or this is the work that you take to Peter at LA Louvre, or this is the kind of work that you take to whoever the dealer is that is. And that is was basically my best function, was aiming students at people, at dealers, and at schools where I thought they would be successful. And there's, there's no uh, 
And also, I taught them to ask questions, to never go in and say, will you show me? To go in and say, where do you think I should show? Do you know what I mean? Because if you're like really good looking, they'll show you. You know what I mean? Because it's all about uh, personal attractiveness anyway. And also, I should explain, and, and I, I do believe this, uh, as Warhol used to say, anybody is beautiful that wants to be. And, uh, and that's an advantage when you're in the art world, which is a relatively small social world even now. And so when you have good artists with skills and with social skills, you know, because if you don't have social skills, you can't play. If you're a scaredy cat, you can't play, period. I'd like to be your defensive tackle, but I'm a scaredy cat. You know, I mean, come on. And it's like, not the, that's not what you do. Uh, the reason I, and excuse me, and I'll, I'll finish here, but there's one thing I wanted to point out is that one of these problems goes all the way back to primary school, is that if you are manic depressive, uh, dyslectic, morbidly obese, uh, you have Down syndrome, you end up in the art department. You know, they shunt all of these sort of defective kids over in the art department. Then all of a sudden, I've got these defective kids in a college, and they're defective, you know, to be artists, because artists, art requires a certain amount of social savoir faire. And, uh, and it involves not being afraid. And so, uh, and I can honestly say that when I was able to put these sort of principles into action, the no group crits was such a relief. Because, okay, I'll, I'll just explain. Why not have a group crit? What do you talk about in a group crit? Well, if something is really good, you say about three words. You say, Judy, do 10 more. You know, that's it. You know, said, these are great, do 10 more. When Larry Joe comes up there and all he's got is a piece of plywood upon which he has scrawled the word boogie and he just doesn't know where to go now. Uh, everybody talks about it for hours and hours. That means the worst students win. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? The losers win in group crit situations. And the little suck-ups make the most noise because they're trying to impress me, but I'm too shrewd for that. And, uh, and then people cry. There is no crying in art. And I, it's like you just get rid of group crits and you've cured a multitude of things. Sometimes I'll go through studios like, and if somebody's working on a painting, I used to have a little blue pad, stuck stick on pad. And if it was finished, I would just write, Dear Margie, this is finished. Stick it on. You know what I mean? So, because uh, there is a tendency to work on things too long. But this would be my ideal way to save the American art education uh, programs. Uh, and I know that it's not what you want. And I know that it's not going to happen. Uh, and. Uh, I could tell you what's going to happen to the commercial art. There's going to be about a 40% skim and within three or four years, but that's another story. <laughs>